A year from now, England's rugby team arrive in Japan ahead of the first World Cup to be played in Asia. Given the nature of this country, it's going to provide some extraordinary challenges. Super Typhoon Trammy is the fifth typhoon to have hit Japan in the last two months. We're going to take you behind the scenes with Eddie Jones as he prepares to make his side world beaters in a country he's passionate about and one that's moulded him into the coach he is today. We achieve something that some team has never achieved before and, and to do that you have to push the limit. You come here a lot, don't you? As you touch down, does it feel very much like home for you? Uh, sometimes and sometimes not. <laughs> uh, I never came over here until I was, I think I was 31. I remember when my wife and I came back, I'd played for Leicester for half a season and we came back through Japan um, and that was the first time. And what was that experience like? Because no doubt, obviously having grown up with a, a Japanese mother, you would have heard lots of stories. Yeah, no, it was uh, funny because it made me understood some of the customs we used to have at home that I could never understand why why we had to do it and the other kids didn't have to do it. But, <laughs> like? Uh, uh, just like things like every time you go somewhere you've got to take a present. So I'd go to you know, someone's place and I'd have to take a present and I'd feel so stupid taking a present. But in Japan, you know, present giving is such a big part of the, the culture. And you're obviously half Australian, half Japanese. Is it a case of diseases that you walk in here and you feel Japanese or what do you feel more of? I mean, most people obviously know you as an Australian. Yeah, I, well, I think that's one of the things I've been lucky with and was brought up just to be yourself, not to be Australian, not to be Japanese. So I found because I, I've coached in a number of different countries um, that owning the identity of yourself rather than try to be someone fit into a culture uh, actually helped me. Feeling a bit English, is it? Well, I think you do change. I think wherever you go, you get affected by the, the culture and you do change. I think I'm probably a little bit more polite than I was before. <laughs> Only a little bit. And you've got two quite strong Japanese women who've influenced you, haven't you? You've, you've talked about your wife keeping you on the straight and yeah. narrow before. And, and, and looking back at the past, your mother as well. Uh, my mum used to just live down the road there. So if she kept on the house, I wouldn't have to work now probably worth about 10 million <laughs> um, but uh, no she's uh, my mother's a very hard person uh, probably too hard sometimes that's where I get the hardness from I think. How much has that side of your family sort of made you the coach you are? Well definitely been taught to stick at things and I think that that helps in coaching because you, know, you have your ups and you have your downs and when you have your downs you've got to stick at it you know you've got to tolerate the criticism tolerate the the hardness of the job at that time and, and get through it. Knowing this place so well and what people are like, what the culture's like, how much does that put you ahead, do you feel? Those kind of intellectual property rights? Uh, well, I think in terms of preparation, it can definitely help us, but you know, the other countries have been very aggressive uh, in coming over here. A lot of them have already played games here. You know, everyone's doing their homework, so it's only a, a marginal, marginal gain, so they say, but uh, certainly we'll use it to our advantage. Having landed in Tokyo, England will then fly 540 miles for a week-long training camp in Miyazaki on the southern island of Kyushu, a location Eddie Jones used during his time as Japan head coach. This is going to be the place where they find their feet, get in the rhythm, put the, put the finishing touches on the World Cup prep and then and get ready for the excitement of the tournament. And you talked, didn't you, when we spoke to you earlier, some teams have been quite aggressive about where they want the base to be. Why here for England? It's just a very good training place, great hotel, and you've got the gym right next door, so the stress for the players is minimal. Warm weather, good food, good training. I hadn't noticed the warm weather. No, it hasn't been warm today, but it will be. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary watching your ops team go round with the biggest list I think I've ever seen to transport a whole training ground over to here. The devil's in the detail. You've got to get these things right. You only get one go at the World Cup. So as you can see, you've got to be adaptable. We've had, we're going to have to move quickly tonight because of the typhoon. So it's all about getting ready and getting as well prepared as you can. What's beyond the trees? Well, it's very the much a, a rural area. So there's lovely beaches just down there, swim, uh, golf. Got two golf courses, 
driving range. Yeah, we're only here for, I think it's only eight days, so it's not a long time. Um, and it's just before the first World Cup game, so if boredom's an issue, we've got the wrong players. <laughs> OK, well, now the bit I'm looking forward to. I can't believe we're all away in Japan and you're taking me to a burger shack. It'll be good, don't okay, worry. OK, OK. This was your sanctuary, so I hear, in 2015. This is the place that you came to gather your thoughts and, and plot one of the biggest upsets in world sport. Yeah, no, I used to come out here. We'd have a morning session and late afternoon, so in the middle of the day I'd come out and have a swim and have a think about what we've got to do. It's a, you know, it's a really good little spot and gets you out in the air. It's refreshing. It's, it's much more fun than sitting in an ice bath. You haven't been out today, though, have you? No, I don't think I'll go out today. If you today. go out, you might not come back. <laughs> Some people might be happy. <laughs> um, when you took over this, the Japan team, I look back at that now famous press conference in 2012. It was disgusting today. We had 15 players out there that did not put their bodies on the line. So it's not funny. It's not funny. That's, that's the problem with Japanese rugby. I'm not serious about winning. You watched that presser back? Uh, no, I've never watched <laughs> it. Uh, I've had, had a lot of people send me comments about it. But the surprising thing was at the end of it, the chairman came up to me. And he said, it's about time someone said that. Um, and I think everyone realised, you know, Japan was one of those teams, they get beaten 50 to 20, and at the end of the game, everyone would clap. Mm. And the players would be happy with that, and we had to change that. How did you take a side like that, right the way mm. through to the World Cup, to pull off such a huge shot? You've got to work hard to, to win. Um, if you do what everyone else does, you're not going to win. Mm. Um, and we just spoke about what a great opportunity it was uh, to change how everyone thought about Japanese rugby. We achieved something that some team has never achieved before and, and to do that you have to push the limits. You changed your captain, didn't you? And, you know, I'd sort of forgotten, you go back and you look and you've got the chance to draw the game, haven't you? And, you, and you're saying, take the points, take the points. And Michael's saying, we're going to ignore you, Eddie, we're going to go against what you want. Yeah, you want people to make the decisions on the field because once, it's like when you get out on that water there, you can tell a person how to surf, but until you get on the wave, you don't know what the wave's going to do, so you have to adapt to the wave. And the same in a rugby game, you can, you can teach people to go there, but then you don't know what the opposition are going to do and you need the players to make decisions. And, and to me, that was the most significant part of the World Cup with Japan, that players who were able to make their own decisions. What was the hysteria like? Yeah, I know it was crazy. I can remember having a coffee with Michael Leach in a place like this and we went outside and someone noticed us and within a three minutes there was a line out of hundreds of people and we couldn't get out of the place. <laughs> Just taking, people wanted to take photos. It was, yeah, rugby became the trendy sport in Japan for that period of time. Well, they were saying it was like bigger than baseball, um, but people were on every chat show, people were crying. It's quite, it's quite amazing, really, isn't it, that you could do that in one game. But it shows you the power of sport, too, to, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, sport can be a very cohesive factor in, in society. And we, we saw it with England during the, the, the Football World Cup, what, a, what an effect it had on the country. And, and that's what we're hoping to do with England with, in the next World Cup. With England, what you did when you came in, you, you brought Dylan Hartley in straight away, didn't you? And you said it was a, a risk you simply had to take. Is he similar in a sense to Leach having that willingness to challenge you? Yeah, no, Dylan's a good, strong character, but we've got other guys there like Alan, who's, who's very similar in ilk, and, and we're lucky to have those two guys. But who debate. makes you stop and think uh, most out of that team? Well, there's guys like, um, who else have we got there? Elliot Daly, uh, all good thinkers, George Ford, all good thinkers about the game. They're the guys, I guess, if you say those, they're the ones that you absolutely have to be here in a year's time, aren't they? Oh, well, I have ones. to be involved in the team, yes, and they're good enough players to be. This morning, I think we had a, a World Cup selection meeting and uh, we're pretty close. How many but, numbers? Uh, we're up to 80, 85%, but we want a few guys to come through and we're hoping those guys do come through. And the early rounds of the Premiership, a few of the young guys have come through well, so we're looking forward to a few more of them. Still time for a bolter. Yeah, we're looking for that guy to just bounce out of the sea. 
Can you see him yet? <laughs> he's coming. I can see him coming now. There's a big typhoon behind him. Yeah. Well, if this recce by England is about preparing for all eventualities, it doesn't get more real than this. Super Typhoon Trammy is the fifth typhoon to have hit Japan in the last two months. Winds are around 110 miles an hour. It's caused major destruction to air, rail and road travel and hundreds of thousands of people have been left without power. In the aftermath of Super Typhoon Trammy, the country's back on its feet quickly and England are able to continue with their recce. After the break, we visit the stadiums where they'll play and get Eddie Jones's bulletproof guide to being a good tourist. Uh, one thing about the bullet trains is that, as you can hear, no one talks. So you've got to... You so we're already in trouble. Sit down, don't be rowdy. It's very important. From Miyazaki, England will fly 950 miles to Sapporo on the northern island of Hokkaido, where they'll meet Tonga in their opening match. The Sapporo Dome proved a successful setting for David Beckham in England at the FIFA World Cup in 2002. Quite a place, isn't it? Um, talk to us about the pitch. You had a good look at the playing surface because it's retractable. Yeah, it's almost like playing on carpet. You know, it's absolutely perfect, as you can see. So they bring the pitch in five days before the game. They have the fans now on to, to make sure the pitch is in absolute op optimum condition. This is the sort of pitch that your players are going to just relish to get out on, aren't they? Yeah, and no, it'll be a quick game. Um, we play our first two games indoor, so Kobe, our next game's indoor as well. So there'll be some similarity in the conditions, both fast games before we get into the outdoor venues. For England fans that arrive in Japan, this might be the first place they come to Sapporo. What's it like? How much time have you spent here? Where are the places that they must go and see? Yeah, Sapporo's a, yeah, more of a big country town. Um, the food's good here, they're big on noodles because it's quite a cold place. Um, and in September it'll probably be about 20 degrees. There's a lot of natural beauty outside of Sapporo, so if they want to come early and then and travel out into the hinterland, they'll have a great time. It's a quick turnaround after game one. Next stop is Honshu, Japan's biggest island, and to the city of Kobe, where they'll meet the USA. It's another magnificent stadium, isn't it? Both the Sapporo Dome, which we were all it was breathtaking when you walk in there, and this one is awfully impressive as well. Yeah, isn't it? very loud again, a little bit smaller, crowds a bit closer, 30,000 people, really fast surface, very fast ground this one. So, the first two games we play on, probably uh, big scoring games. In your mind, have you already worked out what you do with those first two games uh, in terms yeah. of personnel? Yeah, no, I think. Uh, you want to get a, a bit of a flow in the tournament, so you want to keep some rhythm up. Uh, but the first game's the most important, so most of the, the best 15 will play in that game, and then the second game will balance it up. Eddie's been good so far, his little postcard, <laughs> his little tourist thing. So what have you got to do in Kobe? Kobe's got great beef, really good. And it's a nice port city, so it's probably one of the most cosmopolitan outside of Tokyo. Uh, very foreigner friendly. Um, we're, we're going to stay in Roko Island, which has got a lot of cafes, very nice ambience. So it's a good place to be, Kobe. And then, of course, after this, you'd be halfway through your pool already. Yeah, yeah. Not wishing your life away or anything, Eddie, but. No, you know. no, no, it goes quickly. World Cup goes quickly, and, and that's why you've got to prepare really well, understand what it, what's important for each game, and how you've got to move on from each game. From Kobe, England will travel by the fastest bullet train, the Nozomi, at 200 miles per hour towards Tokyo for their third and fourth pool games. It's quite iconic, isn't it, being on a bullet train? It's very iconic. <laughs> um, so we thought lots of the tourists will come and experience it, and we thought, oh, while well, we're here, we might as well get your guide to being a good tourist. So in your mind, what do you think you've got to 
do to be a good tourist? Uh, one of the things about the bullet trains is that, as you can hear, no one talks. So you got to... So we're already in trouble. Generally, you got to be very quiet. Um, most of the Japanese will sleep or do work on the train. So uh, low voices, sit down, don't be rowdy. It's very important. How, how do you think you will players will cope with that? Uh, no, they'll be all right. They'll be good. Uh, but it's by far the most efficient way of travelling because you get here to Tokyo in, in three hours. What about elsewhere? Because we did find, actually, on all public transport, we had a little bit of a tap on the shoulder when we, had, when we were talking on our phones. We quickly learned you couldn't do that either. Yeah, no, well, when you think about it, there's 120 million people here in, in this small island. So they've learned to live together. And so social cohesion in, in public places is just so important. So people try to behave appropriately. And that's, you know, for foreigners, that's, that's a big thing. The other thing that we've learnt, I've got to admit, I'm not particularly good at this, is you've got to be pretty patient, haven't you? The rules here are quite rigid. Yeah, no, no. If something opens at 8, it doesn't open at 1 to 8, it opens at 8. Uh, and you just saw the bullet train. The bullet train was 9.26, comes right on the dot, 9.26. You've got to get on, get off, and so don't miss your stop. <laughs> um, you're, are you very patient? That's probably one of the things I learned here, because uh, I wasn't patience wasn't one of my great virtues. Um, but having lived here for four years, you had to learn to be patient. <laughs> so there's hope for me. Yeah, there's hope for everyone. <laughs> well, you talked about getting them to learn a few Japanese phrases, a bit of language lessons. Well, probably once we get in the camp for the World Cup, we'll have a couple of lessons just so that they know how to say the basic greetings, which can help. And who do you think might be quite good at the old languages? Maybe Maro might have a, oh, yes. a bit of a, kind of a forget about taste them. for language. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the most unlikely? Uh, probably... Uh, I think Dylan might struggle. <laughs> um, the other thing which we've all enjoyed, hot springs, onsens. The thing about the onsen is you've got to go naked. Um, first one to be in there, do you think, of your guys? Onsens, yeah, well they're a different experience. Um, maybe the ex of the boys might like the onsen. I know there's a lot been written about in terms of the, 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 quite a lot of the tabloid press. The tattoo thing is actually quite a big issue, isn't it? Oh, it's a massive issue here because it's strongly associated with the Yakuza, which are the, the uh, crime gangs that have ruled parts of Japan. So it's seen, tattoos are seen as, as being part of that, that gang, so they're quite strict on it. Um, but hopefully we'll have some exclusive use of, of uh, onsens and recovery facilities to minimise that. Uh, I think the guys will be good. I think they'll really enjoy it. And as you can see, it's, it's the most unique experience. You know, they're never going to have it again in their life. So we are off now to Tokyo, and suddenly I guess it ratchets up for you, doesn't it? You've, you've had your time in Miyazaki, you've had your time in Sapporo and Kobe, and as you hit Tokyo, I mean, it, it's suddenly Argentina yeah. and France. How different do you feel this pool sort of looks now than maybe when the draw was made, or maybe even this time sort of last year? Uh, not much different. Look, Argentina are always a good World Cup side. So they get that real strong family feel, so it's going to be a tough game. And then obviously we've got France following that. They're important games for us because to get through to the playoffs where you want to get, you've got to have tough games. But we've just got to play well. Favourite bit on the route? What have we got to look out for? Uh, I think today you'll see Mount Fuji on the way. I was going to say, will you see Mount Fuji? So it's Fuji Sun on the left hand side and it's an iconic mountain. England play Argentina at Tokyo Stadium before their final pool match against France at the International Stadium Yokohama. Should England get out of their pool, their quarter-final will be at Oita Stadium with the semi-finals and final both being held back in Yokohama. Well, Eddie, here we are, World Cup Final Stadium. When you took on the job and said, yep, we're going to go win the World Cup, are you where you thought you'd be at this point in time? Well, you never know. Uh, that's, a, that's the great thing about sport. You know, one day you're a great team, next day you can get three or four injuries, uh, something can happen overnight and your team changes. So the, the thing about World Cup preparations is timing your run. It's a bit mm. like getting a horse right for, a, for the Gold Cup. You've got to have them right on the day. It's no use being right 12 months before. It's no use being right six months before. 
yeah, we've got 12 months now to, to put certain uh, tactical plans in place. We've got 12 months to get the players physically right and mentally right for the challenge ahead. What do you think that biggest challenge will be over the next 12 months for you? Look, I think when you're putting a, a World Cup squad together, it's always about selection. You know, the biggest thing is to get selection right, to make sure we've got the right balance of players, got the right balance of a squad to take to World Cup, because as you know, you've been here for a week. Uh, we're going to be here for nine weeks. That's the, and the challenge of getting the squad right is so important. That mental side is almost as important, isn't it? Because these guys are going to be under an awful lot of pressure. They're going to be in an environment where the spotlight's going to be on them all the time. Are your squad mentally tough enough to cope with that, do you think? Oh, definitely. No reason why we won't. Uh, and the, the good thing for, for our team is that most of them have experienced the bad side of that. Um, you know, they, they were, the majority of the squad were involved in the, the home World Cup and, and, and know what it's like. And you need that experience of failure. You need that experience of, of experiencing a difficult World Cup to have a good World Cup. Mm, I know that you won't make a decision yet, but Family is obviously, for quite a few of the players, something that they feel that they perform better with. How difficult is it to know what's right in that situation? Some players don't want to have their family. Yeah, it's a very individual thing, um, but we'll have the flexibility in the program to ensure that those who need to see their family can. Do you wake up every morning and think about the Rugby World Cup final? Uh, have you got the little clock still in your office? Still got the, the countdown clock. Still got the clock, yeah, it's uh, winding down, but... Uh, uh, it's not more about the final, it's more about the first game. You know, you get to a World Cup, it's about taking each game as it comes. You can't get too, too far ahead of yourself. So it's lovely to be at the, the final stadium, but the most important game is, is the Sapporo game. And do you ever think about that 03 final? Does that ever come into it? Because that must be part I of the I get reminded play. every day by the English people. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't mentioned it. I've been here a week and I've not mentioned it. No, uh, not really, no. I mean, is that a driving force for you? You experienced the bad side of it that day. Uh, it was for two years after. Uh, I think I really struggled when I look back. Uh, but now I've moved on, you know, had some success, had some failure, and, and you, I'm just excited about what's ahead. Japan is a country that prides itself on immaculate timing. With less than a year to go, will England get their timing right? This World Cup might not be won by the best team, but the one who's best prepared to adapt. And the local knowledge and insight that Eddie Jones can bring may well make all the difference. Sky Sports. Feel it all.